Welcome to Coast to Coast. My name is Lily Weinberg, and I'm here joined by my colleague, Kyle, Kyle Kudachief. How's it going, Kyle? Hey, Lily. Good afternoon. And our audience members may notice that Kyle is not Lillian Corral. Um, Lillian um, is, is, has started her maternity leave, um, and we wish her, her the best. And Kyle, you are calling in from Akron, Ohio. How's Akron going? We're, it's great, and we are technically still a coast, the north coast, the thing, uh, Great Lakes, <laughs> a half hour south of Lake Erie, so it's great to still uh, work with, within the name of Coast to Coast. That's right, that's right, um, and I love that, that you said that you're a coast too. Um, we claim so, to be. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly, um, and you're doing a ton of great work um, around public spaces in Akron, and of course, um, as you know, and as our audience knows, um, we have done a deep dive with Coast to Coast looking at the future of cities, and really looking at the future of cities um, all over the country, um, and, and markets from New York City to Akron to, to everywhere in between, um, and so today, I am really excited to talk talk to an expert um, around urban cores and around placemaking. Um, and I know that Dan has been doing um, tremendous work um, also in Akron. So can you tell us a little bit about what we're going to be learning today? Yeah, first let me introduce our guest. Uh, we're uh, thrilled to have Dan Biederman. He's the uh, founder and president of BRV Corporation and National Consultancy, as well as the co-founder of the Grand Central Partnership, the Chelsea Improvement Company, the 34th Street Partnership, and Bryant Park Corporation. He currently serves as the president of the 34th Street Partnership and Bryant Park Corporation. He is a busy man, and we're glad he's with us. Uh, he's a today, very busy man. <laughs> very busy man. Uh, today, we're going to look at Thank how cities... Call. Yeah, hey, Dan, welcome. Uh, today, we're going to look at how cities can activate public spaces during the pandemic and how urban spaces can think creatively about operations and sustainability during a major financial uh, crisis and major challenges. Lily, is there anything else you're interested in learning today? Uh, no, I'm, I'm really excited. Dan, thanks for joining us. Um, I am in particular, and I think our audience members will be really interested in that sustainability piece. So um, I know that you guys are going to have a great conversation. I'll see you guys in uh, roughly 15 minutes. So Great. Thank you. And as a, just a reminder to our audience members, as you have questions during the conversation, please, on Twitter, use the hashtag Night Live or the comments section on the Facebook page. And with that, Dan, let's dive in. And as a starting point, tell us a little, about, a little bit about your work in theory around building, operating, and maintaining uh, excellent public spaces. Okay, great. Thank you, Kyle, for the opportunity. And those of you who are put off by uh, the tie and suit I'm wearing, um, I do it so that my deputies dress in business casual. If I dressed in business casual, they'd be in beach wear. <laughs> I have to do this even when it's 95 degrees. Um, the, the difference between our approach to public spaces and many other people's approach became really clearest to me when Bryant Park and Millennium Park were both um, either in renovation or in the case of Millennium Park in Chicago in new construction, new creation. Uh, the budgets ended out, uh, Bryant Park, which was the first project in my career, $9 million capex, capital expenditures, Millennium 475. So that's not normally what you hear about New York versus the rest of the world. New York is supposed to be expensive, extravagant place, and other places are more sensible. Uh, the 475 included 150 million of subsurface stuff, but still their, their budget for capital expenditures on the surface was 40 times ours. So I said, gee, we, we probably have something here. Bryant Park, for those of you who haven't been there, is really a success of programming, careful budgeting, horticulture, lighting, horticulture is very cheap compared to bricks uh, and mortar. And um, rather than architects and landscape architects, I noticed in the attendance list, there aren't too many of those on the call, so I don't risk offending too many. But uh, when you go down the road with an expensive design, with an expensive and talented firm, you very often uh, uh, are going to overrun budget. In the case of something like Pershing Square in Los Angeles, not have a uh, project that gets off the ground. So our approach has always been very light on capital expenditures. The guy who did Chelsea Market in New York, who's a genius, said to me once, I start with a capital expenditure budget of zero, and I only grudgingly go up above that. So that's what we do. We are uh, programmers, 
Um, and um, we believe by endlessly churning the improvements in the programming area, paying attention to small details, softscape rather than hardscape, we can make a huge impact. And that's, we've been in 32 states now across the country. We're loving working in Akron with Kyle. He's incredible. And um, you're all gonna look at Akron in five to 10 years and say, look at all these creative things the city did. Yeah, they changed from rubber to polymers. Now in the public space area, they're doing some really creative stuff thanks to the Knight Foundation. So that's, that's a sense of how we work. And then Kyle, I guess the other thing I could mention is, um, and this may not be politically popular, but broken windows was correct. Um, most of the people on the call probably understand the derivation of the term um, came from Wilson and Kelling's work in Newark and Boston. Um, the equivalent of broken windows for Bryant Park was stopping small violations from occurring. And, and that's how we got at the 500 felonies a year that um, uh, had made the park a miserable place to be. So those were small things, cursing, spitting, making comments to women, loud radios at the time, smoking, pigeon feeding, all of these things were ruled out. And we just gradually worked down the amount of crime until there was nothing much. So I hope in, in mentioning those two or three things, I've given you a sense of how we view either turning around parks or creating new public spaces. Yeah, I'd love to follow up on two aspects you mentioned, one being the funding and two being that uh, uh, making the park a place for everybody. Starting with the funding, your uh, ability to get private dollars to support public space is well known. Uh, how has that shifted since March, since the, the pandemic has set in? Well, I was um, much too boastful about how brilliant our business model was before COVID because all of a sudden my business model, which relied for not a penny on either government funding or uh, philanthropy was endangered. So we ended out having um, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, trouble putting it back together um, uh, because our, our rents from um, restaurants and the like disappeared and some of our sponsors said they just could not promote out, outdoor events. But basically the Bryant Park, um, I'm sorry for the construction noise in the back, which is a surprise. No, uh, it's okay, we'll roll with it. Okay. The um, Aguirre, you might go find out who that is and tell us. <laughs> uh, um, so with those disappearing, we're not as boastful as we used to be, but basically the idea is don't use government money because it can be endangered at the drop of a hat. Don't rely on philanthropic money. Interestingly, Central Park, we're, we're very friendly competitors, only has those two uh, basic methods. Uh, I, I think Jesse Brackenberry is on the call from um, um, Rose Kennedy Greenway, and he has a, a different version. Um, but um, uh, we uh, tr try hard to get all of our money from food and beverage rents, from sponsorships, from naming rights arrangements, even some licensing. And we started with very little money. We've increased the budget at Bryant, which is our model across the country from um, uh, 210,000 a year to 21 million a year. So we've increased by a hundred times. Uh, and um, uh, we feel better about that method of uh, earning the revenue side of our operating budget. When you, I know you started doing this work in 1980 at Bryant Park. Was there a, a point in your career where uh, corporate support shifted from being not really interested in public space to being really interested in public space? And what was the pitch you made to get them to bite? I know many of us across the country are trying to get that, that same level of investment in our public spaces in our, in our cities. You have to have a terrific park for anybody to feel that associating their brand with you is as exciting as associating it with a concert hall or a baseball stadium and the like. So in the early years, we were relatively less successful before we became glamorous. Uh, and then people uh, came in from big brands. Obviously, a lot of you listening, not being in New York, LA, Chicago, Philadelphia, or, or San Francisco, are thinking, gee, I'm not sure that would work in our uh, city that's less than top 10 in population. But we feel a number of other cities have a chance to do this. Uh, just to mention two that are, um, 
uh, punch above their weight that we've worked in Pittsburgh and Nashville. They're regarded by some of the brands as cool places, and therefore you can find uh, those monies um, from cities like that. But um, I once, Kyle, I once made a speech about earned income, and a guy came up to me and said, um, after a very smart guy, said, uh, I think I got the message of your speech. If you want earned income, you will have earned income. If you don't go after it, you will have zero. And um, we started with $15,000 uh, uh, sponsorship from a German steel company that was doing an IPO on the New York Exchange. It came out of nowhere. We didn't even know how to price it. And now that number is $7 million pre-COVID. So there, you, you have a lot to learn. You're going to go south, down some uh, pathways that are false, uh, dead ends, I call them. Uh, but you keep trying. Is that corporate support staying strong since March? Are they still uh, investing for the remaining of the year? Are people getting cold feet? Uh, wh what's your sense from where you sit? The uh, four traditional big buyers of sponsorships for us, uh, let's see if I remember them all, airlines, tech, um, uh, food and beverage, and um, clothing, interestingly. Zara mm -hmm. sponsored our... Um, uh, Wi-Fi in the park for a couple of years, uh, and banks. I love banks out. Um, they vary. Uh, Bank of America, one of our key sponsors, is very cautious about sponsoring outdoor stuff in the face of COVID. Um, the tech companies are still around. We just got a nibble from one of the FANG companies for 100K, and I, in the old days, I would have said, that's nice. Today, I was home. I said, I'm going to go dance on that table. <laughs> money now. Yeah, no, I, I, I believe you. I uh, wanted to come back to the safety. You had mentioned uh, making Bryant Park a safe place again. How do you give, advise people to make a public park safe, but also inclusive and a place for, for all of New Yorkers to feel welcome? How do you and your, your staff uh, balance that? Uh, how do you balance that? COVID specifically, right, Carl? Yeah, well, I mean, that, I guess pre-pandemic and, and currently, I mean, how do you keep the park to be a, a place for everybody, for, for all of New York to come in? Well, let me start on the more broken windows side. Um, yeah. Early on, um, the park, uh, William H. White Jr. was my mentor early. He said, if you wanna know a place is safe, count women, count men at the same time. If you're anywhere near 50-50, you got a safe place. Women are very acutely aware of their personal security. Uh, so we got Bryant Park up to about 60% females uh, pre-COVID which is wonderful. That means nobody has fear about uh, safety. Uh, with all these techniques I mentioned, um, post COVID, um, we've done a couple of things you see in the stores or airports and the like. We have arrows telling you where you can walk. Bryant Park is not nearly as crowded as it was pre COVID, but it's getting back. Um, and um, there are hand washing stations in place of our old uh, water fountains. Um, uh, crowds above 50 really can't be encouraged. So give you an idea, I don't, I hate to give this idea away, but it's a, it's a good one. We're trying to do a concert version of a Broadway show um, uh, uh, and have it live streamed rather than have it played to a large crowd in Bryant Park. It's, we face all kinds of issues with that, including Actors' Equity, the local theater union. But um, uh, the, the, the aim has been to make things smaller, still entertaining, still looking good. And then outdoors, our winter village activity, we're trying to make an entirely outdoor operation. And New York's weather in the winter, we're climate zone six to seven. So it's 40-ish degrees most days, 35. So it can really be an outdoor event. Uh, in the past, it was outdoor and indoor. You put on your skates indoors. So all kinds of adjustments have to have been made, Kyle, to try to stay safe in both ways. And is the outcome you're seeking with those events to uh, generate revenue, keep the park relevant, uh, incorporate the arts? What, what, are you, what are you hoping to achieve with that kind of an event? Well, we had, uh, when all this started, uh, two or three aims. One is um, keep the park safe because as Midtown's uh, security has declined, uh, post COVID and plus some criminal justice changes that have been very tough on New York uh, order maintenance. Um, we needed a lot of people in the park. So that's, that's purpose number one. Um, but then the counter to that is separated. 
uh, by at least six feet with everybody wearing masks, et cetera. Um, and then the financial model, as I said, we're up to 21 million this year. We're really going to take a revenue hit. So we've had to ratchet everything down. So, um, had to be creative. Um, again, I, I, I got too cocky that my business model was the right one. And those who relied on, um, government and philanthropy were endangering themselves. It turns out COVID makes it harder on me than some of the others. Yeah. Um, and maybe staying on the revenue thread, but pivoting from New York to national and to your, your consulting practice, as you look at public spaces across the country and your, your various clients, do you find, are they in a similar boat as you? Are they in a worse situation being in smaller or, or mid-sized markets? What's your sense? Uh, just give you some examples. Uh, most of this has been in the paper, so I'm not betraying confidence. Uh, um, Fly Warren Park is, uh, the revenue model in Dallas, we, we programmed and budgeted that part, uh, endangered by the restaurant really not doing well, possibly going out of business. Um, uh, San Francisco, uh, Salesforce Park on top of Salesforce Transit Center. Um, uh, the, the view of the client is that now is not a good time to program in any way. We really could be doing things like yoga on a very big lawn with plenty of separation, but we're not. So that's suspended. So uh, I would say not only did COVID cause me to, uh, well, this is gonna sound familiar to some of you, uh, renegotiate a lot of my deals. Uh, luckily, the deal with Kyle was done <laughs> before under no, no uh, illusions about what COVID was gonna do. So we didn't have to renegotiate with him, but most of our clients, we had to renegotiate the deals because of delays. And um, Existing projects, we said, okay, the business model is going to take a hit. What the hell should we do? And um, I'm working uh, harder uh, 40 years after I started this career than I was 20 years ago. Maybe as a closing thought before we go to questions, is there any area that you'd recommend a public space uh, from a revenue standpoint to be investing in or to be leaning into uh, in the year ahead? Or is it all uh, challenging from an earned income standpoint? Well, one of the lessons we haven't gotten to that we often tell clients, too many parks, and I'm not gonna throw them under the bus here, but I can think of a few, rely on too many large festivals and, and events, and they're periodic. So you can wander into the downtown of a city and see a sign that says the jazz festival is uh, Friday the 25th at this time, and you're out of luck because you're there on the 18th. So. Um, we believe in the amenities, as we call them. Those are the things you find every single day in some of the parks I mentioned. Um, uh, juggling clinics, um, ping pong going on, putting green, uh, petanque, the French game with the steel balls, a lot of you may know, uh, knitting classes. All of these things are pretty steady. A piano, we have a ragtime and jazz pianist in, in Bryant and a few other places. So um, all of that stuff, is where I recommend you start and create a scene because the crowds never go down to small numbers in normal times. Uh, and then that, from there, you can go to an occasional big festival and you'll become more glamorous. You'll have a higher female ratio to males and uh, then you can build your revenue side. That's great. Thank you for those comments. Lily, uh, if you'd like to come in, let's see what yeah. type of questions we have from our audience. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks. This is a great conversation. Um, and we are getting a lot of questions from the audience, so I'll just dive right in. Um, so, so Dan, there's, there's a cluster of questions around um, this, you know, your work around um, the earned revenue model um, and, and sponsorships. And, and there are questions that, does this work for non-downtown public spaces or, or public spaces that aren't in the urban core. Can you, can you tell us, does it work? And, and, if it, and if it does, then if you could give us some examples. Harder, but I've often said to such places, particularly if it's in a neighborhood that's, a, let's say, a poverty census tract, mm -hmm. I don't know what those are called today, but some, you know, where the income is quite low. Um, there are a couple of um, sources that are open to those places that are not open to us. We got laughed out of the Ford Foundation when we went to them to ask for money for Bryant Park because they looked at me, they looked at my chairman, it was the chairman of Time Inc. at the time, and said, you guys don't need us. The places that need us are exactly the kind of parks that Lily is characterizing. Neighborhood parks, mm -hmm. great impact on a lot of people, but far from the 
glamorous places um, in downtown. So that's the first thing I say. And then uh, the other advice I give is, is don't give up on building small numbers uh, upward in areas like food and beverage. You never know um, if the government agency that regulates will cooperate, whether it's possible to build on food and beverage and eventually turn it into a real income earner. And the other thing about such places is the expense side is less. There's a mm. HBS, Harvard Business School, who talks a lot, I'm forgetting his name, uh, Porter, I think, Michael Porter, uh, talks about how the economy of places like that is entirely different. They're, the product can be provided at a lower price. So it's not inexpensive to do anything in uh, downtown San Francisco or New York. Everything's expensive. That makes us sweat mm. on the revenue side. That's a great point. Um, okay, so I want to dig a little bit um, further, Dan, and there, there are some questions around this. Um, uh, around Kyle's um, uh, question around crime and inclusivity. And, um, and so a, a couple of audience members um, wanted to go a little bit further. And, um, and, and so you talked a bit about safety around COVID, um, but I think that there's, there's a, 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 um, a general sense that, that if, if we're focused on crime, then um, that can make a public space um, you know, not welcoming um, for all community members, especially as we think about people of color um, and, and public spaces. And so I'm wondering how, how your firm is, is thinking about that and making sure that, that public spaces are, um, you know, welcoming for all, especially during the, the racial reckoning that we're having in our country. You know, we, we, um, we I've had a different view of um, the term inclusive when applied to parks. Um, mm -hmm. um, I say something that may not be that popular to say, but parks are inherently, urban parks are inherently inclusive. Why? Because the people who, who need them uh, uh, do not have some of the alternatives that high income people have. Country clubs, vacations, big backyards, uh, luxury restaurants. The average income in most of the parks we've done in urban areas has been in the $50,000 range. In New York, that's not a high income. Uh, so that's uh, answer number one on the inclusive point. On the kind of broken windows point, you know, it'll be interesting. I think the proof's going to be in the pudding. Um, New York and several other cities have gone away from it. I think much to the disadvantage of people of color because they're much more open to the depredations of people who would violate any of those rules originally. Our standard for Bryant Park broken windows enforcement is that nothing that would scare a female is permitted, even if it's, it's uh, permitted by uh, the rules of the park. So if a guy comes in, we have a lot of emotionally disturbed people wandering around midtown Manhattan. If a guy comes in and looks like he's going to um, take his clothes off or start screaming at people, even though there's no penal code provision that stops that. If it would scare a female, we, we don't let it happen. We just, we're, we're too exposed to problems. We've, we've argued that we have a safe space, so we've gotta make sure that we provide that to especially the females who come there, and that's how we get an above 50% female rate. Got it. And so, and, and there were there were some questions around that, um, the the kind of the the percentage that you you know you said the like fifty fifty male female and and so tell me a bit about how you are capturing that data. Like how, how do you how do you go about doing that? And and is that important for um, our our public space leaders to to be yeah. monitoring they, the data? They should do it. I'll try to give a quick answer so we sure. can take the questions. Those clickers they used to sell in a store called Hamaco Schlemmer, one in your left hand, males, one in your right hand, females, send people around the park. I used to do it myself. We trained them. Don't be mm -hmm. about it. If somebody moves, guy in the green shirt moved 20 yards and now I may have moved them twice. Don't worry about it. Um, and give those counts to the bosses. Uh, take them twice a day, one o'clock and six o'clock. And it's that simple. Um, and if you've got 50% or more females, you've got a great place. Got it. Okay. Um, and, and, and anything around leveraging technology around 
tracking movement and, and data? Yeah, good question. Some are doing it. There are some products that'll go to each of your entrances mm -hmm. count. So that's raw count. They won't do male, female for you. We also try to do some ethnic counts to make sure we're uh, racially diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, do them rarely, partly because we, we don't make a big deal of it. We just, and somebody says, this is not a diverse park. We want to have data showing not. Interestingly for Bryant, for example, uh, Friday and Saturday nights are the most diverse times there. Hmm. People, most workers go back generally to the suburbs or other neighborhoods. People in other boroughs of Manhattan uh, come to the central area to have what's essentially a free experience. And that's another piece of making Bryant Park it, it, inclusive. Everything in Bryant Park is free, except for two things, a carousel ride or buying food. But uh, you can have an entertaining day there without spending a penny. So that's Got it. That it. was one of the questions, Dan, actually, was, was um, are you monetizing those activities? Um, so uh, it sounds like no. Um, Generally not, just all, except if you say all the people coming in for all the free stuff eventually say, hey, let's get a meal at that cafe. Got it. Got it. Um, so, so one, one, one more question from the audience, and and I'll, um, and then we can, we'll, we'll, we'll be wrapping it up. The time flies. Um, I, I want to. There's a question around arts and and how arts plays a role um, in placemaking, and and we've seen we've seen it also very interesting during this time during the pandemic, um, playing you know a functional role too. Um, can you talk a bit about how you know arts plays a role um, in in placemaking in your work? It's funny, I'm much more partial to performing arts and, and music, mm -hmm. theater included, than I am to visual art. Um, and it's odd because my wife is a fine arts lawyer, so I should be more on the visual arts side, but um, uh, I haven't been, um, partly because the art that I regard as good, and I've kind of had my eye trained by her, is um, beyond, our, beyond our price range. Um, so. Um, people can have a wonderful time with a, a bluegrass group or a jazz group um, that may not cost us more than about four or five hundred dollars and everybody gets to see it for free. So mm -hmm. we, we've been more on the performing arts side. We did have a, a project with the Public Art Fund, which does a lot of emerging artists in New York for several years, especially in the years when Bryant Park was so dangerous that no one in their right mind would go do a program there. And we did get some artists um, to go in and do some emerging art, and it was, it was helpful, but we've gotten away from that. I'm not as much on the percent for art side as others are, I'd say. Got it. Um, uh, but the performance art is, is, is amazing and, and you know, creates a, a, a great environment too. So, um, so with that, um, I would uh, love to invite you, um, uh, we're, we're in the final minute, um, to, uh, on any final comments. Um, in particular, um, I am, very, very um, curious about your thoughts around um, kind of the future of, of public spaces and, and, and what, what you may see. I know that, that, that there's a lot of doom and gloom right now, but what you, what you might see as, as some of the opportunities um, in our communities um, as we think about um, the future of public spaces. A couple of comments that I think of as you say that. First, outdoors is generally better in COVID. Yeah. So um, uh, that opens up a huge opportunity for us to steal audiences from concert halls, the movie theaters or Broadway, um, or off-Broadway theaters or regional theaters in your towns. Um, uh, an interesting phenomenon is developers being forced to put in their projects anywhere from two to 10 acres of public space, which they generally mm -hmm. don't know what to do with. So our clients are very often mixed use development companies and interesting sidelight um, professional sports teams, which have now uh, learned not to have empty arena areas when their team isn't there. We've worked for the Packers, the Falcons, uh, the San Francisco Giants, now the Detroit Pistons oh, wow. on that kind of work, all, all the sports, uh, the Jets and Giants also. So um, uh, I think uh, it's uh, uh, a new area of, of uh, activity in outdoor spaces that aren't called parks in any sense. They're plazas mm -hmm. connected to entitlement battles between developers and uh, authorities. And a whole raft of public spaces have become pretty neat that have uh, 
uh, are hardscape, but um, programming brings them alive. And uh, that's a great incoming opportunity in the era, era of COVID because those are out mm -hmm. in the for people. And so you see, so if I understand you correctly, um, you see a, a, a trend to accelerate um, having these outdoor spaces and outdoor plazas um, uh, within the private sector. Um, so. Yes, the, the, the entitlements um, process works along. They're stuck with, as they see it, an acre or two of space they don't know what to do with. So uh, we have one in Nashville like that now. Client is very helpful and um, they know that they shouldn't just leave an open green lawn. It should mm -hmm. attract people at off-peak times. And that's where programming comes in. So it fits in with BRV's method of, of doing things. Fantastic. Well, I'm excited to see what that looks like um, across the country. And, and thank you, Dan, um, thank you for all. joining us uh, and chatting with Knight Foundation. Um, Kyle, thanks for being um, the co-host today. I had a lot of fun with you. Thank um, you for the invitation. It was great to be with you, Lily. And thank you, Dan. Uh, Thank you. And, and next week um, on Coast to Coast, um, we're going to do a deep dive in Philadelphia. Um, and we're going to be looking at um, how um, engagement works um, during a pandemic and, and some of the interesting ways that um, communities are leveraging technology um, around engagement. Um, so same time, same place, Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, Kyle, I'll see you soon. See you later. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Stay, Stay well. Care.